Good morning. As you heard from our host, Reed Dickinson, this is the last week in our series of uh, The Power of Myth, based on the book by Joseph Campbell with Bill Moyers. And today's topic is a very interesting topic. It's a big topic. It's the masks of eternity, which really is a, a good bridge to our focus for next month, where we look at the book, The Power of Now, and we're going to be talking about the eternal present moment, which is dealt with in this chapter in a very expansive way. Uh, one of the things Moyers says in his conversation with Campbell, he says, whatever, uh, whatever eternity is, it is here right now. And uh, followed up by a comment from um, uh, Campbell who says, and if you don't experience it here and now, you're not going to get it in heaven. <laughs> well, it's big stuff, you know. In other words, I think what I got out of that for me is he's saying, um, don't wait to experience eternity. It might be here right now. There's so many ideas in this book, and it occurred to me it would be so wonderful for us to have an opportunity to discuss the month's reading in depth and really take out little bits of it and sit with it and digest it. And I, I think that would be a good thing for us to do. So next year, 2015, we're going to refocus our Wednesday evening services so that we can have a face-to-face -face interactive discussion about the topics of the month and the books. So this is giving you advanced warning. Buy all your books. Get read up for next year. Make a date with us on Wednesday evenings to come and discuss it. Because as much as I love social networks and social media and the Internet, there is nothing, nothing, anywhere that beats a real-time, in-person, face-to-face connection without a smart device or a screen separating us. So I take it from that applause, you'll all be there. I'm really looking forward to it, actually. But let me not avoid the topic of eternity. You know, um, one of the ways of talking about it in the book is the subject of heaven or where will we go after this life? Now, there's a big subject. I mean, it's a difficult topic to talk about because it can be so tender. And wrapped up with it are all these notions that come from our religion of origin, from our society. There's superstition. There's cultural ideas. It's all contributing to this great mystery of life after life. And it occurs to me that no matter how much a person reads about it, and no matter how many other people's opinion you take in and integrate, it, it comes to pass that in the end, each one of us have to arrive at a very personal answer to that question. We look at things, big ideas like this, in the Beyond Limits class that um, is registering the last day today. And this year we're doing a Saturday morning class. I'm teaching it, and Reverend Jeff is doing an evening class. And we examine how to go beyond the confinement of previous conditioning and how we inherited worldviews about such things as God, heaven, hell, sin, forgiveness. But all the way through the class, there's this strong emphasis on discovering a very personal answer for you. Now, some people are relieved when they get to the class and say, oh, thank heavens, you're not going to tell me what to believe. And other people are disappointed. They say, what? I was hoping you had an answer. You're not going to tell me what to believe? Now, Joseph Campbell in this book, he says that um, we have to, if we really want to understand the great mystery, we really have to go beyond all of the normal images that we've had, that we've inherited and integrated from wherever they came. We've got to go beyond those limits so that we can lean into the vastness of being and understand it in a new light. I think one of the great mysteries um, of life is um, that of life after life. And I think it's one of those mysteries that has been used to 
inspire fear rather than awe. I know certainly for me growing up, the way I encountered the mystery of life beyond life was in the teaching that if you behave a certain way right now, then you'll be assured of this and that in the world to come. Terrifying. Or in the other form, if, if you believe this or that, then it'll, it'll work. The outcome will be good for you in the next life. Terrifying. Because I could never, ever bring myself to believe what was being proposed. <laughs> So you can imagine the relief when I found the Center for Spiritual Living and I realized through the teaching that it was absolutely okay to question everything. To not know the answer was allowed. To disagree was encouraged. To explore potential answers and to change your mind midstream was enjoyed. And I came out of it with the idea that no harm comes from not knowing the answer. Since discovering Centers for Spiritual Living, I can say quite honestly that I have become less interested in where I will go when I die. I guess I'll find out when I get there. (laughs) Although I'm very interested in other people's ideas about it because we are so amazing. I love to hear it. But I would say that I seem to have become more fascinated with the fact that I am here at all. (laughs) And asking myself the question, if I can actually be here. That is really interesting. That I... I'm here, but quite often not. (laughs) Right? There's a Polish artist whose name I cannot remember, probably because it's so complicated. He uses his images to make commentary on some of the ironies of modern society. And one of the pictures of his I was looking at recently has a man, and he's looking through a periscope at the scene outside through a very high window, and you can see through the window this gorgeous, green, bright landscape. And the irony is that all the while the door is open, and that he could actually literally step through at any moment and be in the landscape. And the interesting thing is that the periscope is in the shape of the Facebook icon F. He could just walk through and be there now instead of experiencing life through a periscope. (laughs) It makes me think about eternity and how sometimes um, the longing for eternity is the periscope when all the while the door is open for an experience of it here and now, like what I'm reading in the book, don't wait. Don't wait for the eternal. It might already be here. You know, Campbell makes a distinction between um, everlasting and eternal. Very interesting stuff. I mean, he, everlasting is a measurement of time. Eternal is beyond time, above time, independent of time. Um, everlasting is going on forever and ever. The eternal is not touched by any of that. Interesting. In fact, he says, tick, tick, tick of time shuts out the experience of eternity. How about that? Just something to think about. So all concepts that deal with measuring time, anything that has to do with before life or after life or heaven or then and when, anything after and before takes us out of the experience of divinity. Just something to think about. Here at the Center for Spiritual Living, to us, the eternal, why, that is a synonym for the thing itself. 
that which is beyond time and space, that which is begin the great mystery, that which is beyond beginning and end. It, it didn't begin, not with a big bang, because that would be a beginning. That's something to think about. And don't you know when I consider the idea that that is what I am made out of, or that is where I exist, in that it messes with my concepts about myself, doesn't it, for you? I mean, when I think, what does it mean to be part of that which is beginningless and endless, that is beyond the reach of time? And, well, you know, I'll tell you what it causes me to think about is my beginning. <laughs> Where was I before I was born? Before this life. Well, sometimes I think, and maybe you have thought this too, that life doesn't actually begin with conception. In other words, I don't think that we started with this particular life. It's, it's just that I, I don't remember where I was. <laughs> or with whom I was hanging out. I don't remember that. Or do I? Hmm? Well, it's something to think about. I mean, because I don't remember right now who I was with, then I, I think whatever is next, perhaps I still won't remember who I was with. I don't know if I'll recognize anyone that I've been with. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that yet. To be perfectly honest with you, I have this sense from time to time that I recognize some of you. That I remember some of you. It's like we've been together forever in a never-ending story. So now the question, will I be with my loved ones when I die? Well, I have a new way of talking to myself about it. I ask myself, well, who do you think you're with right now? <laughs> or where do you think you are right now? Where in eternity do you think you are? I mean, really, haven't you met people who you, it feels like you know them? Or haven't you met people and you know right away that you have incomplete business with them before they say good morning? <laughs> and haven't you met people that you love and you can't explain it? So I don't ask so much myself the question, will I see my loved ones again in the next life? As much as I dwell upon this thought that I say to myself, while, while I see you right now, I don't want to miss a moment of it because it's so very, very beautiful. And you know, sometimes I do miss the moment of being here with you, my beloved, now, for any number of reasons. Sometimes I miss the great mystery. I pass by the great mystery of being in the moment well, because of rushing, uh, because of, um, oh, I don't know, dwelling in the past, um, comparing my experiences to others that I, I, I'll never have, to... Um, clinging to, obsessing to, um, oh, longing for a different future, longing for a different past, you name it. Reliving memories of the greater how it used to be. But I tell you, I'm improving. Because I am learning how to recognize the present moment. And now that might sound strange, but I mean it. I am learning how to notice the condition of being and to stop when I can, to stop reaching out from the moment 
to the past or to the future, to stop that, to pause for a moment so that I can land in right now. I've been reading Paul Tillich, you know, the eternal now, and in it, I think what he's saying is that sometimes we avoid being in the present moment because we can't deal with the fact that all created things have an end. So we flee the moment. That's amazing. He writes so beautifully, one of the greatest writers of our time. He says, listen to this, talking about this message from creation that all created things end. He says, it may reveal itself to you in the farewell to a place where we have lived for a long time. The separation from the fellowship of intimate associates. The death of someone near to us. Or it may become apparent to us in the failure of a work that gave meaning to us. The end of a whole period of life the approach of old age, or even in the melancholy side of nature that's visible in autumn, all of this tells us you will also come to an end. Well, created things, certainly. And then he says something so beautiful about our human condition. He says, as humans, we are aware of the eternal to which we belong and from which we are estranged by the bondage of time. How about that? As soon as we start measuring it up and dividing and getting out of the moment, it estranges us from the condition of eternity. Huh. Similar to what Campbell said, tick, tick, tick of time is what shuts us out from the experience of eternity. Start measuring Start fleeing the moment and you lose the present. Our founder said it too in more plain language. He said, if we were to attempt to put a finger on any period of time, it would be gone before we could point to it. For yesterday is gone and tomorrow has not come and today is rapidly passing. <laughs> So now is the experience we are going to be turning our focus onto and we'll be talking about it the whole of next month. I thought that rather humorous that the topic is the power of now, but we'll be dealing with it later. <laughs> oh, well. Well, now is a beautiful word. I invite you to think about it as the word that describes your being and it's um, it's a not a it's not a moment that can be located it's a um, an ex an, it's an experience it's a, a feeling of being present it's a a, a way of witnessing it's um, it's characterized by watching by noticing, it has a feeling of recognition in it, and it's a, an experience which eludes us when we rush, rush, rush. And don't you know the whole world seems to be rushing somewhere, stimulated by matters of such urgency and important, all of which are quite real. But how important, I realize, it becomes for us to stop when we can't press the pause button so we can catch ourselves and return to the moment to access the eternal. And Paul Tillich says one of the ways of accessing the eternal is through prayer, which is so appropriate because in our tradition, prayer to us is a meditation on the eternal, the higher power, the thing itself that which is beyond time and space, a recognition of it and a personal identification with it. That's our prayer. And he says that when we pray in this way, that is what lifts us up, elevates us up out of the cycle of measurement and separation into a true appreciation of the eternal nature of the present moment. Nobody all of the time is aware of the present moment. 
but it does come to us. It comes to all of us. It sort of pops in to our awareness. It's those moments when we experience being totally present and time has evaporated. People tell me they have that experience when they witness their grandchild being born. Or maybe it's that experience when you are the recipient of an extreme act of kindness. Or maybe it's a moment when, without warning, you see something that to you is incredibly beautiful. Or, or maybe it's in that moment when you, without preparation or without seeking, suddenly become aware that everything is all right. Or maybe it's um, in that moment where inside yourself you remember your amazing capacity to love. Or maybe it's that moment when you realize that you aren't what you were taught that you are. Or maybe it's that moment when you suddenly witness that you love a child, a friend, a parent, a person, and the world stands still. You know, these moments for myself are different probably to the way your moments are, but I know for me that when I do successfully, well, you can't reach for it. When I do land in the present moment, it doesn't have the effect of disconnecting me from life. It doesn't render me senseless or zoned out or zened out. No, it's just the opposite. It helps me connect deeply. It helps me meet this world of ours because don't you know, every day, everywhere we see poverty and prejudice and violence and it is the moments of eternity that help me face it and talk about it and not flee from it. It helps me be present for the world with less reactiveness and more presence. Now, how a person is to access the eternal, eternal moment is different for each person. But I think it, it, could be, it could be as simple as taking the time to have a slow conversation with a friend. I think it could be. I think it could be as simple as mindfully carving out the time to sit somewhere and do nothing. It could be. Or it could be um, the willingness to go out and help somebody to accomplish something, to do something that they have been struggling to do for themselves. Whatever it is that you do, it is characterized by lack of stress, struggle, strain, coercion, rushing. There is a yielding in it, a yielding to eternity in you. Hmm. Let us pray. In the infinity of life where we are right now, all is present. The eternal is the direction of our prayerful gaze. 
that we might recognize it as being beyond time and space, not limited to this current experience or this planet or this beginning or any endings. We identify ourselves with that. And in so doing, there is a, a rebirth in us that goes beyond the w ability of words to describe a renaissance in us individually in which we, so to speak, wake up to the expansive nature of our being, how the eternal is simultaneously our true nature while we live in this body, in this time, doing these things and loving the way we do. And as we pray in this way, we realize, we make real, we realize that being lifted up this way into an appreciation of eternity is something that not only blesses our own experience, but is in a way a true and abiding contribution to all of creation. And so we rededicate ourselves to know the truth of our being without force or coercion or control or convincing, letting all people be as they are, we take ourselves to the task of knowing gently the truth of our existence. And we celebrate that with hearts open wide for even further revelations to take place and looking forward to how we each might be stimulated to take our place in the world with right action and right words so that the blessing of the eternal moment comes through us into all that is. <laughs>